shine it to the light. So at that point, coincides with that point, you've now got a continuous um, wave. And that means that the L wave, when shunted to the right, will sort of look like this. And that is now the fine LR plus delta wave, because the phase difference by shunting it to the right is delta. And now once again, where it crosses the point where the wave function equals zero, I'm going to call that R1 and I'm going to call that R2. Let's look at the fine LR wave, that's the solid wave. When it crosses the uh, point where psi is zero, that means that sine LR is zero, which means that LR1 equals zero, A equals pi. And when the sl LR1 is fine, the sine of LR1 is zero, which is what you get here. Here, you've got that the sine of LR plus delta is zero at R2, which means that LR2 plus delta equals pi. Therefore, LR1 equals LR2 plus delta, which means that delta is equal to L into R1 minus R2. But if you observe, R1 is always less than R2 because you have to shut this wave to, to the right in order to match up the uh, discontinuity. And that means that delta is negative because R1 is less than R2, so this is going to be a negative term. So that explains the, if I can redraw the diagram, if you remember, the experimental results for measuring delta at different energies were that you got a graph that looked like that, crossing the origin, they were in fact two that I'll just draw one, crossing this point when delta changes from positive to negative at about 300 MeV. So what is the explanation? Well, the explanation is that low energy, the neutrons, which is, remember, neutrons bumping into protons in the target and scattering. At low energy, the neutrons are getting into the point where they are experiencing the attractive nuclear potential that we talked about when we drew the square well that looked like that. This is an attractive nuclear potential at low energies. But when you get to high energies, what you're really seeing is that the neutron, so the neutron is bucking up against the proton. And if you go to higher energies, potentially the neutron and the proton will kind of start to merge. And nature will not have that. Nature does not want densities being created, infinite densities inside the nucleus. So the trick is to say that at this point, the potential goes the other way. It's now a repulsive potential, which says if you get too close, instead of that nuclear potential being an attractive potential, it's a repulsive potential in order to hold the nucleons slightly apart so they don't crash into one another, so they don't attempt to merge. So that is telling us something about the shape of the nuclear potential. What we are saying is, is that up to some point R alpha, which is what we had before, the nuclear potential is in fact a repulsive potential. If the separation of the neutron and the proton is less than R alpha, then the nuclear potential will force them apart not pull them together. That stops them from crashing into one another or even attempting to merge. But once you get to R alpha, the nuclear potential now becomes a attractive potential up to the value of R zero, which of course is going to be equal to, well, R total radius is equal to R zero, H to the one third is our standard definition for the radius of the nucleus, and that's this value here. And thereafter, it's zero. So our shape is um, over the very first small distance, which might be of the order of 0.5 Fermi, 
if you try to get any closer than 0.5 meters apart, you move the head to be hung. I would hold it between 0.5 and, uh, well, for, in the case of a neutron or proton, about two fermions, it's attractive, and thereafter it's zero. In practice, of course, um, the potential is not quite as square as that. It will look something like this. Is the repulsive potential to potential this is separation? The repulsive potential is stopping you from, um, in fact, you probably get up to intensity actually rather than curving off, uh, to stop um, uh, the uh, proton and the neutron from colliding. Here is where you are going to be able to uh, have a, an attractive force and then taper off to zero. And this, what this essentially means is that once you get inside, the protons and the neutrons can be, as it were, evenly displayed. They can't get any closer because if they attempt to do so, this repulsive force will pull apart. So you get an even distribution of the protons and the neutrons within the nuclear um, attractive force. And that is why when you measure nuclear density against distance, you get something like this, where over the broad range of the radius of the nuclear potential, the density is uh, constant, and only at the edges does it taper off. If there were no repulsive term, of course, the nucleons would all be attracted and squash into one another, and you would get essentially an infinite density, um, uh, when the separation was very small. This arrangement with the repulsive potential at very, very small distances means that you can keep a standard constant density throughout the broad range of the nuclear force. So this is giving us some idea about the shape of the nuclear potential. So, today we're going to look at a basic introduction to the nuclear shell model. The shell model is one of a number of models used to describe the nucleus. These are called phenomenological models. And what they do is they describe the nucleus as if it were something else by analogy. So in this case, the shell model describes the nucleus as if it were behaving like electrons in shells around an atom. The purpose of all these models is to help us to understand and explain the behavior of the nucleus. Now we have seen from previous videos that the basic structure of an atom is that there is a central nucleus, which we'll talk about in a moment, with orbiting electrons. There may be many electrons orbiting an atom or orbiting a nucleus. The nucleus itself consists of protons and neutrons. Photons are positively charged, neutrons have no electrical charge. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how can it be that a nucleus that has got a number of protons does not self-destruct? Because the Coulomb force of repulsion should make sure that all positively charged protons repel one another. But clearly that is not what happens. And so we have to say that at least over the range of the nucleus, there must be a force, which we call the strong nuclear force, which is able to hold the protons together and is stronger than the Coulomb force, which is tending to push them apart. We are aware from the videos that we've done on atomic physics that electrons orbiting a nucleus do so in well-defined energy levels. And what we say is that no two electrons in any single atom can occupy the same energy state. Or to put it another way, they can, no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. We'll talk about those in a moment. Now it might initially have been thought that whereas electrons are required to occupy their own energy levels because they're not allowed to be in the same energy state, they're not allowed to have the same four quantum numbers, that might not be true when it comes to the nucleus. In fact, you could consider the nuclear force as simply being a kind of a bag 
which holds all the photons and the neutrons together, squashed together, so there's no room, and they all just sit there um, quietly and stably uh, inside this nuclear force which stops them from getting out. However, we know that in relation to electrons orbiting nuclei, you can, if you give them sufficient energy, kick the electron out of the atom altogether. That can be done, for example, with a photoelectric event. If you take a sheet of metal and you shine light on it, that light usually has to be in the ultraviolet range, then you get electrons coming off. This experiment was one of the forerunners of the development of quantum mechanics. And what is actually happening is that a photon of the ultraviolet light is transferring its energy to the electron. And provided there is enough energy in that photon, the electron can be kicked out of the atom, out of the binding of the nucleus. The nucleus is exerting a positive force on this negatively charged electron, causing it to stay in the atom. So if you give it out, if, if, if you give the electron in that energy, you can kick it out of the atom altogether. And that's what's happening here in the photoelectric event. Now, in a similar way, you can also kick a nucleon, either a proton or a neutron, out of the nucleus if you give it enough energy. The difference here is that, for example, if you take hydrogen, a hydrogen atom, and you have an electron in its ground state, then to kick an electron out of a hydrogen atom, you need 13.6 electron volts of energy. But if you want to kick a proton or a neutron out of a nucleus, you will need energy in the range MeV, millions of electron volts. So significantly more energy you need. Now, if you plot the energy required, this is the energy required to kick one electron out of an atom, and on this scale, you put the number of protons. So essentially, you're putting the elements along the bottom, starting with hydrogen and going maybe all the way up to uranium. What we're going to do is to kick one electron out of each of these atoms, and you measure the amount of energy you need to do that. What you find is that you get a graph that looks something like this. It's not quite as... Uh, as as obvious as this, but it, it has this kind of shape to it. You get peaks. And what you find is that those peaks correspond to what are called the noble gases. That helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And the qualities of those gases, and the reason they're called noble or inert gases, is that the rings of electrons around those uh, nuclei are full. There is no space for any spare electrons. All the rings are complete. And the argument is that when you have complete rings of electrons, that is to say all the shells are completely full in the electron shells, there is an additional energy or a binding energy which binds those electrons all the more closer to the nucleus. And consequently, you have to put in a lot more energy to get an electron out of one of these gases than you would for, say, an element right next to helium or an element right next to neon, where the binding energy is significantly less. You don't have to put so much energy in to get one of the electrons out. And in a similar way, what is found, remember, these are generally in the electron volts, is that if you now, instead of trying to get an electron out of the atom, you now try to get a proton or a neutron out of the nucleus of the atom, and again, we're going to look at them from, say, hydrogen up to uranium, what you will find is that, again, you will get this sort of shape where there are peaks. But they do not correspond to the peaks that you get for electrons. Thank <laughs> you. 
the case with electrons, you need significantly more energy to get a proton or a neutron out of a complete shell than you do if the shell is incomplete. And it's that experimental result that gives rise to the idea of a nuclear shell model where protons and neutrons, instead of just being held in the nucleus as if the nuclear force were a bag holding them all together, but maybe the protons and neutrons also occupy shells within the nucleus. Now the peak can occur when the number of neutrons or the number of protons in the nucleus are equal to the following numbers. Two, eight, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. In other words, if you have that number of protons or neutrons in a nucleus, then you will find that you will need significantly more energy to get one of those protons or one of those neutrons out than you would if you were using basically uh, the protons or the number of protons or neutrons in a nucleus were different from those numbers. Those numbers are sometimes been called magic numbers. And those numbers apply to protons and neutrons. So you might have a nucleus, for example, that has 20 protons and 20 neutrons. And that would be very stable. And that, of course, is calcium. Calcium has, or one of the isotopes of calcium has 20 protons, 20 neutrons. That is a very, very stable nucleus. You need a lot of energy to eject either a proton or a neutron from calcium. Now we know that when electrons are orbiting the nucleus, there's the nucleus, there's an electron orbiting, we know that the force that is keeping that electron essentially in orbit is the Coulomb force, the force between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electron. That's the Coulomb potential. The question is, when you've got protons and neutrons in the nucleus, they're not orbiting anything. So what is it that keeps them inside the nucleus? And the answer is that there must be an interaction between each of these protons and neutrons and the combined effect of the interactions between all of them is the resultant nuclear force. But this kind of picture is very difficult for physicists because it means you have to try to model the interaction of every single proton or neutron with every other proton or neutron in the nucleus. That's called a many body problem, and it's mathematically very difficult. And so the way that physicists traditionally have got over this problem is to say that you can take any one of the nucleons, proton or neutron, let's take that particular one there, and we say that that proton or neutron will experience a nuclear force which is made up of the total of the impact of all the other nucleons. So in other words, this nucleon is being affected by the sum total of all the rest. And that then reduces to what's called a two-body problem. And that's much more easy to cope with. And if we are arguing that the strong nuclear force, which is a force operating between each of the, of the nucleons, is a binding force, it has to be, because it's got to hold the nucleus together, then essentially we can regard this nucleon has been in a potential well. Here is the potential well, there is the nucleon sitting at the bottom of it, and that, as it were, the binding energy. You would have to give this nucleon this much energy if you wanted to get it out of the well, in other words, if you want to get it out of the nucleus. Because the combined nuclear force of all of the other nucleons essentially is what is binding this nucleon into the nucleus. And you have to overcome it with this amount of energy to get the nucleon out. Now the question is, what is the shape of that nuclear force? If we were to plot the nuclear force,